Good morning, Gospel. Let's take some time and um, worship together and to be encouraged together with the Word um, in prayer, in singing, um, and, and as the Word is preached this morning. Let's sing together. take some time this morning um, and turn to scripture. And so today we are going to be reading from Psalm 119, 49 through 56, and also verses 65 through 72. So let's read together. The psalm says, Remember your word to your servant, in which you have made me hope. This is my comfort in my affliction, that your promise gives me life. The insolent utterly deride, deride me, but I do not turn away from your law. When I think of your rules from of old, I take comfort, O Lord. Hot indignation seizes me because of the wicked who forsake your law. Your statutes have been my songs in the house of my sojourning. I remember your name in the night, O Lord, and keep your law. This blessing has fallen to me that I have kept your precepts. You have dealt well with your servant, O Lord, according to your word. Teach me good judgment and knowledge, for I believe in your commandments. Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I keep your word. You are good and do good. Teach me your statutes. The insolent smear me with lies, but with my whole heart, 
I keep your precepts. Their heart is unfeeling like fat, but I delight in your law. It is good for me that I was afflicted, that I might learn your statutes. The law of the Lord, or the law of your mouth, is better to me than thousands of gold and silver pieces. Let's pray together. Oh Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for what you have continually done, that that who you are is not wrapped up simply in what we are experiencing here on earth, but it is wrapped up in what you have told us about yourself and your character and who you are, that you are um, loving, that you are merciful, that you are patient, and that you long to give us rest. And we thank you that you give us rest in your word. But so often we acknowledge and uh, we confess that we do not turn to your word, that, that we turn to other things instead of your word. And there are sometimes that even in our hearts that we want other things more than we want you and your word. So please forgive us, O God, of this, and please help us turn to you. Please give us rest and solace in who you are. Rest and solace in knowing that you are Lord and that you are good. You continually remind us that we can find peace in your word, that we can find peace in living and following after you, that we can find peace because of what Christ has done for us. So no matter what the circumstances are for us, please remind us of this. Please help us encourage one another and others to live by this as well. We thank you for this hope that you have given us, that we have a firm foundation, that we have something that we can stand on. And we ask that you would grow us and mature us to be those who continue to long for your word. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, Gospel family, so glad that we can open up the Word of God together uh, this morning. Uh, We are praying for you. The pastors are praying for you. Uh, We so miss not being together and sharing life the way that God intended the church to be. But we know in this season uh, that God is teaching us many things, and we don't want to waste our quarantine. And so I'm praying for you, praying that you find joy in the midst of the trials that you are facing, that you find great victory in Christ, um, and that uh, he is teaching you many things for his glory and really for your good. Well, we are back in the book of James, just walking verse by verse through the book of James, and we find ourselves today in James 1, and we're looking at verses 12 through 15. Now, we've already talked about how we are to find joy in the midst of various kinds of difficulties and various kinds of of trials and how we can uh, go to God and ask him for wisdom when we lack. And so in the midst of the trial, we know we're not going to understand everything. We know that we don't know everything. We know that we can't even perceive everything. And so we must depend on God. We must have this confident trust in him. And this week, we look at when we face the trial, that if we do not let God do the work that he wants to do, many times that can lead to a temptation. If we will not submit and surrender to God's way in the midst of the trial, we find ourselves going against God. We find ourselves being disobedient, which is sin. And so this morning, we're going to come and see how temptation, if we are not careful, can lead to sin. Now, when it comes to our battle with sin, we must know our enemy, and really, we must know ourselves. Our enemy, Satan, is deceitfully active in our battle with sin, as 1 Peter 5 talks about. Satan, what does he do? He tempts, he deceives, he he lies, and he devours. But what about our relationship with sin? What about our relationship with temptation? The line between Satan's actions and our own are at times closely linked in the Bible. Satan, for instance, filled Ananias' heart to lie to the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 5. Satan can tempt because of a lack of self-control, as 1 Corinthians 7 says. 
Satan can also deceive us so that our thoughts are led astray, as 2 Corinthians 11 says. So how does this interplay between Satan's temptations and our actions, how does it actually work? And so if we want to understand our enemy and, and and we want to understand ourselves, we must answer these kinds of questions. And so James becomes a guide for us. James is given to us as encouragement to keep going in the midst of trial, to go to God for wisdom, and to fight temptation. And so let's look at this together. Looking at verses 12 through 15, it says this, Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under the trial. For when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it, is con when it has conceived, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. In verse 12, he starts off with, blessed is the person who remains steadfast under the trial. Now, now that word blessed, it's the same word that you find in the Beatitudes in Matthew chapter 5. And it makes this verse itself really a Beatitude. Blessed means more, much more than the mere happiness of really a carefree life. Life that has little conflict or, or life that has little trouble. It really carries the idea of a profound inner joy and satisfaction. A joy that we learned in week one only comes from the Lord himself. And it is the Lord who is only able to bestow on those who for his sake and for his power faithfully and patiently endure the trial that they are going through. Right? God gives you what you need to conquer the trial. It is God himself. God gives you himself. Peter speaks of, of trial that proves your faith and, and results in the praise and the glory and the honor of, of Jesus Christ. And so the man who perseveres under trial is the man who never relinquishes his confident trust in God. He is a true believer who perseveres and becomes the man who has been approved by passing the test with his faith really intact. So the principle is really clear. Perseverance brings God's approval. And his approval brings the crown of life. Now the term there in verse 12 of crown, I don't know what you think of. It's, it's borrowed from the, the big sporting events that were in the, the arenas. And so it's speaking of someone winning, the victor, receiving a crown. It's not speaking of royalty. It really was a wreath that was placed on the winner's head. It symbolized that this person triumphed. They persevered through the event, the event that they were facing. A, a more literal translation could really be the crown, which is life. We receive life as we endure, as we persevere through the trial, we receive life in God. We realize the life that God really has for us. Consequently, a, a more accurate statement of the principle is this, is that perseverance attests to God's approval, for it gives evidence of eternal life. It gives evidence of your salvation and my salvation. In other words, perseverance does not result in salvation and eternal life, but it is the result and evidence of salvation and eternal life. So James, what is he doing? He is clearly associating faithful perseverance under trial really with genuine love and a determination to follow God. Perseverance being one of the, the surest evidence of those who really love him. That, that phrase, in fact, is a biblical definition, really, of a, a genuine believer, a genuine follower, a person who truly loves God. John also uh, repeatedly connected the love of God with gen genuine faith. In 1 John 4, 8, he says, anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. In verse 16, he goes on to say, God is love, and the one who abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. And also in chapter 5, verse 3 of 1 John, it says, For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. P 
Peter also writes of this in 1 Peter 1. He says, And though you have not seen him, you love him. And though you do not see him now, but believe in him, you greatly rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory. Paul wrote that any person who does not love the Lord is cursed in 1 Corinthians 16. So we see this connection between this perseverance, this genuine love, this genuine faithfulness that endures through the trial, does not give up, does not give in to sin, doesn't go the opposite direction, but is obedient in the midst of the trial. And so we could say that a genuine Christian really is a person who demonstrates true faith by an ongoing love for God that really cannot be damaged that can't, really cannot be destroyed. It, it can't be lessened by trials or troubles or afflictions. It doesn't matter how long it lasts. We see in the persecution, the believer being faithful, the believer looking to God, the believer submitting and surrendering to the trial that God might deepen faith, not destroy it in the midst of it. But the question I think this morning is how do we persevere, how do we keep loving God through the trial? Well, I think there's some things that we need to understand, and that's where we're going to walk through this text together. The first thing that we need to understand in verse 13 is temptation. It says there, let no one say when he is tempted, I am be tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. So we see this focus on temptation. In verse 12, we see it more as a trial, and in verse 13, we know that if we don't respond to the trial correctly, that then leads to temptation. So if you respond in faithful obedience to God's word, you successfully endure the trial. If you give into it, if you give into the trial, if you give into your flesh in the midst of the trial, if you're doubting God, if you're disobeying, then you will easily be tempted to sin. Right response leads to spiritual endurance. Right response. Your obedience leads to greater perseverance. It leads to greater endurance and righteousness and and wisdom and blessing. Really, in verses 2 through 12 of James 1, that's what we saw. Seeing how persevering, seeing how enduring the trial leads to verse 12, which is this blessing from God receiving life itself in what is true life, not something that is an imitation. And so a right response leads to this endurance and wisdom and and blessing, but a wrong response leads to what verse 15 describes as death, that we die. Now, that that is interesting that, that really it comes down to the direction that you and I are going, the way that we face and respond to the trial. In his first letter to the church at Corinth, Paul makes clear that temptation is really common to every person in 1 Corinthians 10, 13. No person, including the most spiritual Christian, can ever escape temptation. James is making clear you're going to face temptation. In fact, most likely, actually, if we would all admit it right now, we've all given in to temptation. We've sinned in the midst of our temptation. Why? Because we weren't obedient to God. We went the way of our flesh. Even the Lord in his humanity, who was without sinful flesh, was tempted by the devil. And so temptation is not a sin. To be tempted is not a sin. You and I, our response to temptation can be the sin. Us giving into flesh can be the sin. Just as it is common for man to be tempted, it is also common for him really to blame someone or something else. So we're all tempted, and we're also all tempted to not accept uh, the, the consequence of our actions. We want to blame others. We want to shift it to someone else, not only for being tempted, but many times in our own lives, we, some, we succumb to that. And so from the beginning, one of the chief characteristics of sin really has been the tendency to pass the blame onto other people. We know this. If you're a parent, you know that. Honestly, if you're truthful, you know it. how you have passed the blame. I know how I've passed the blame. I know how I can easily make excuses. What is that? That is not enduring the trial. That is giving into the temptation. That is giving into sin. 
And so when God, think about this with Adam and Eve, when God confronted Adam with his sin in the Garden of Eden, Adam's reply was what? In Genesis 3.12, he replies, The woman whom you gave to me, who is with me, she gave me from the tree, and I ate it. And so we see when God approaches Adam, what does Adam do? He blames his wife. When the Lord then asked Eve, what is this you have done? She replied, it was the serpent. So, so God comes to Adam. Adam blames Eve. God comes to Eve. Eve blames the serpent, right? The serpent deceived me and I ate it. And so we see how easy it is, the pattern of blame that goes on in us not accepting really our responsibility. And so James is saying that he clearly has no kind of patience with the idea that you and I can blame our situation for why we sin. I think if we're not careful, we could even see it within the coronavirus. You know, what are some trials that, that have come from that, that maybe if you give into the flesh, it would be easy to blame the coronavirus for the sin that you've committed. Different things that you might be able to think of, things that hopefully in your family worship time that you will unpack together as a family. And so James says there's no room for that, nor does James allow for the notion that the devil made us to do it. Even more passionately, James opposes the idea of blaming God, declaring in verse 13, let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. The idea there is saying, let no person say to themselves, let no person rationalize Hey, it was God who did this. Hey, it was God who tempted me. So we don't even rationalize it. The very idea of that would be offensive to God. The way that the language actually reads is that no one should say that God is even indirectly responsible for temptation to evil, right? He is in no way and to no degree responsible directly or indirectly for being, for our being tempted. And so you and I, to persevere through the trial, Uh, to be victorious in the midst of it, we need to understand temptation. The second thing I want you to see that we need to understand is understanding evil. In the last part of verse 13, for God cannot be tempted with evil and he himself tempts no one. So God cannot be tempted. He is untemptable. He is without the capacity for temptation. It's the same as being invincible to to the salt of evil. In, In other words, the nature of evil makes it inherently foreign to God. God and evil exist in two distinct, different realms that never meet. He has no vulnerability. God is not vulnerable to to evil. He is utterly secure to its assaults uh, against. And so he is aware of evil, but he is untouched by it. Now, I think of back in in Isaiah, Isaiah 6, if you think of it for a moment, while Isaiah stood transfixed before the Lord, one of the seraphim cried out, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, the whole earth is is full of his glory. Shortly after he instituted the covenant of Sinai, the Lord commanded Moses to remind his people Israel, you shall be holy for I, the Lord your God, am holy. In Leviticus 19, also in 1 Peter 1, God repeats that command to the church. You shall be holy for I am holy. What are we declaring? We're declaring that God is holy. That there is no evil and he does no evil at all. In in Hebrews, it says the Lord Jesus, who was God in human form, is described as holy, innocent, undefiled, separated from sitters. That's Hebrews 7, 26. So reinforcing what James says at the end of verse 13, he, God himself, does not tempt anyone. Paul, what does he do? He assures believers, as we mentioned before in 1 Corinthians 10, that no temptation has overtaken you, but such as is common to man. And that God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will provide the way of escape also, so that that you will be able to endure it. That's that same word, endure, persevere. You will be able to make it through when you depend upon God. And so God allows the trials in which temptation can occur, not to solicit you as a, as a believer to sin, but to move you to greater endurance, as verses 2 through 4 speak of in James 1. And so when you think of your sin, God didn't make you do it. God did not tempt you with the evil. God allows the trial and you will either be obedient in the trial or you'll be disobedient and your disobedience leads to greater temptation and it leads to greater sin. The third thing that we see that we need to understand is 
desire. In verse 14, it says, but each person is tempted when he is lured away and enticed by his own desire. So, so this is where we see the sin, how it comes in and how it plays part in our own life. It says that we are tempted when we are lured away, when we are enticed, and we're enticed by what? We're enticed by our own desire. Other versions say lust, the things that we want, the things that we go after. And so each person we know faces temptation. It says there in the beginning of verse 14, each person. You and I are not immune. Every human being is tempted. There are no exceptions. And also, as we look at the language here, it's in the present tense, which means that it gives the idea of something that continues. It repeats, meaning you will continually be tempted. The, the temptation will be repeated. Uh, you will not get away from it. You will be lured. You will be enticed. But when we have this great confidence in God, we don't have to give in to those things. So we see the, the, the fact that you and I are lured away, that we are enticed. We see that it's from our own desire. Uh, lured away has the, the meaning or idea of dragging away as if it's compelled by really an inner desire. It was often used as a hunting term or to refer to a baited trap that was designed to lure an animal into it. Enticed really was commonly used as a, a fishing term to refer to bait. You bait the hook, right? You put some bait on the hook, you lure the fish out of its safety, out of its comfort, and uh, you are trying to catch that fish. And so animals and fish are successfully lured to traps and hooks because the bait is attractive. And what happens? It becomes so attractive that they do not resist. It looks good and it smells good. It's appealing and it appeals to their senses. Their desire for the bait is, is so intense that it causes them to lose caution, to overlook, to ignore what they even know. What do fish know? I don't know, but to, to, to ignore what they know and they give into the trap or the hook and it's too late. Well, think about the language that he's using. He's using it on purpose because it applies to our life. It, we are exactly the same way. We succumb to temptation when our own lust or desire draws us toward evil things that are appealing to our desires. We overlook. We move forward without caution. We forget the word of God. We look past it. And so this desire refers to a deep and, and strong lust or longing for any kind of good or bad. So temptation can look attractive and pleasurable and you lose caution. You overlook the trap. Temptation many times can be disorienting. It's, it's a defiling experience when evil is presented to us as good. It's when destruction comes dressed up to look like happiness. Sin only occurs when we believe that the destructive lie can actually grant happiness. So Satan tries to make the temptation as attractive as possible. But there would be no attraction of sin were it not for our own sinful desires, which makes evil even more appealing than righteousness. It makes falsehood more appealing than truth and immorality more appealing than purity and the things of the world more appealing than the things of God. We are to put off the flesh and we are to put on the spirit. But in these moments where you and I, where we give into temptation, we cannot blame Satan. We can't blame uh, his demons. We can't blame other people around us. We can't blame the world in general for our own desire. We cannot blame God. One theologian said the problem is not a tempter from without, but it's the traitor that is within. And so we are not tempted even indirectly by God, verse 13 says. But we are directly carried away and enticed by what? By our own desires. The fault is entirely within us. It's in our unredeemed flesh. Although we have been saved, although we have been made partakers of his divine nature, as Second Peter says, and we have the Holy Spirit within us, we nevertheless retain an enemy within in the form of, of sinful flesh. We have corrupted longings and passions and, and desires. Even that which is said to be good, even that which is honorable, can be lusted after for sinful reasons. Food and sleep. 
essential things for life. We all need food. We, we all need sleep. They are wonderful. They are necessities given to us by God, but we can also abuse them. We can eat too much, which leads to gluttony. We can sleep too much, which leads to laziness. We can give in to the desire to do what we want. Eat as much as you want. Sleep as much as you want. You can see how easily something that is good can be abused and it becomes sin. And so you and I, we know our desires, we know our longings, and we must be mindful of those things. While we're all vulnerable to the sins that Scripture forbids, each person has his or her own set of desires that you must be careful of. Behavior, which is temptation to, to one person, really may have much less appeal to another person. And so it's not like we all have the same temptations. For some of you, food could be of no temptation to you. You don't even think about eating. You have to remind yourself or other people have to remind you to eat. Other people, maybe that's all you think about. We know how one desire or temptation could be appealing to one and not so appealing to the other person because your desires are certain in your own life, not necessarily in the life of other people. And so our, our commonality is not in the same desires, but our commonality is in the fact that we all have desires and we are susceptible to them and we have to take responsibility in our response to them. Again, remember, you're in the midst of a trial. What is God looking for? He's looking for your, your obedience. He's looking for how you and I will respond in the trial. If we reject God's way in the midst of the trial, we are for sure diving in to sin. We are for sure giving in to our desires. What is the outcome of that? Verse 15 gives us the outcome. The outcome is sin. Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. So really, here is the heart of the teaching that James is giving. Remember, he's writing to encourage believers. He's encouraging believers that have been dispersed. They're being persecuted. They're facing trials. They're outside of Jerusalem. Uh, they're away from what was comfortable. And so he's saying, be mindful. Don't give in to sin in the midst of the trial. And so here's the heart of his teaching. Through James, the Lord here makes clear that sin is not an isolated act or even really a, a series of isolated acts, but rather the result of a, of a specific process. And that's what he gives us in verses 14 and 15. And so what is that process? The first there is desire, as we've talked about. Ephesians 2 describes how before salvation, all people are slaves to lust and slaves to desire, right? And these things bring forth death. It's following the way of, of the world. Well, as noted before, desire is itself morally and really spiritually neutral, meaning that, that, that people have different desires. It doesn't mean it's naturally wrong. It's what you do with those desires. It's what is motivated in, in those desires. And that's the outcome that can be easily be, be sin. And so it begins primarily as an emotion. That's where desire begins. It's, a, it's an emotion. It's a feeling. It's a longing for something that at first may be largely hidden. It develops from somewhere deep within us, expressing a want to acquire maybe something that we don't have or achieve something that we haven't done or, or possess something that we, that, that we don't have. Something we see or hear about maybe suddenly grabs our attention. Maybe I read it the other day, someone on Facebook, they said they went out, they wanted to get out of their house because they'd been in there way too long. They went for a drive. And when they went for a drive, they stopped by a car dealership and they weren't intending to purchase a car. But what did they do? They came home with a new car. How does that even work? It wasn't something that was on their mind four hours beforehand, but they went for a drive. They looked, they looked with their eyes, they began to desire, and so they purchased it. Now, I'm not saying that that purchase was sin. I'm just saying it's easy to see how desire affects the outcome even in our life. They gave in to the desire once they saw that vehicle, they bought it, they purchased it, and then they put it in their driveway and they took a picture for everyone to see. And so it's easy to see how our own desires can work that way, how we can be tempted. Maybe it's something that you don't have that you've been looking at. Maybe it's a boat. Maybe it's golf clubs. Maybe it's a, a new lawnmower. Maybe, who knows what it is, right? Maybe it's something simpler than that, right? But you focus so much so on it that you desire it. What do you do with that desire? Should you have that thing? 
Is it really good for you? Those are the kinds of questions that we have to ask. It's desire. It develops from within us. It's the desire to acquire or achieve or possess or or something that you want. It's something that grabs your attention and, and you don't let go of it. And so desire for the wrong things, what does it lead to? The second thing that we see there, it it leads to deception. Deception. Deception, which is more closely really related to the mind than it is to the emotions. You're deceived. You know truth, but you're deceived. You're deceived by what is going on. And so when we think about a desired object, our mind begins really to rationalize or justify why we should have it. That is virtually really an automatic part of the process of temptation that all of us face. It's something that's within. We don't have to tell our minds to to rationalize our desire because they are already so predisposed really by our sin, by our fallenness, by our flesh. So it's kind of like the animal or it's kind of like uh, the fish that goes after the bait. The desire to have what we want is so strong that we are inclined to ignore the dangers. We're inclined to ignore the the harm. We're inclined to ignore the caution, the truth that is around us. So simply wanting it justifies the effort to have it. It's at that point that James says that desires have been conceived. It's like this idea of giving birth. The desire gives birth to something. What does it give birth to? It gives birth to sin. It has started to form. It has started to grow. And that leads to the third thing here that we see there in verse 15, which is disobedience. It leads to sin. When plans start to be made to fulfill the the emotional desire that that we have and that we have rationalized, that we've justified to ourselves over and over again, it leads to, if we're not careful, it leads to disobedience. It leads to sin. And so this stage obviously involves our own will, right? Our conscious decision really to pursue that thing that we were looking at. It causes us to look away from the possible dangers. It causes us to look away from the harm that can come. And so this desire gives birth to sin. It forms, it grows, it leads to disobedience. And because the will is involved, this is a stage where the most guilt lies. What has been longed for and rationalized is now pursued and it's a matter of choice. And James is very clear where this leads. It leads there in verse 15, it leads to death. That which is desired, that which is rationalized, that, that, that which is actually done and committed and, and accomplished, sinful desire leads to deception and deception leads to disobedience and disobedience leads to death. Now this is the thing. The earlier that you and I resist the temptation in the process, the greater the likelihood that we will avoid the sin, that we will walk away from the sin. But the longer that we wait, the longer that we delay resisting, the more likely the actual sin becomes to you and I. And so what are we challenged to do? We are challenged to control our emotional response to temptations when we first see them, when they first appear, when they first pop up in our life. We bring truth to that. We open the word of God. We go to God in the midst of it to fight sin with truth. And so much of the battle that we face when it comes to temptation is actually fought in our thinking. It's actually fought in our minds. And so you and I are to train our minds. We're to to keep watch over our emotional desires. Don't rationalize temptations, right? Prepare in advance to oppose them and do that with God's word. I think of Romans 12 too. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by what? The renewal of your mind. I mean, Paul even knew that there was this constant need for us to renew our minds, to be changed, to be transformed. And so you and I, Don't be conformed to this world. Be transformed by the renewal of your mind. That by testing, we see it there in Romans 12, there is testing. You may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. That you and I must think upon those things that are good. Think upon those things that are right. Remember this week, you're going to face temptation. You're in the midst of a trial. Your flesh will tempt you. What will you do? So just a couple takeaways this morning. The first one is this. Your flesh doesn't want to escape temptation. The the hardest part about fighting temptation is that we often don't feel like we want to escape it in the moment, right? 
Eve wanted the fruit. Adam took the fruit from his wife. I mean, they wanted it. And so in that moment, it felt right. Well, don't rely upon your feelings. Don't rely upon your emotions. Though we are no longer a slave to loving really dead things, you and I are still tempted to believe that those dead things will bring us joy and happiness and and life. But they don't. You and I are tempted to believe that sin is better than God. That obedience to God will actually kill my joy, not increase my joy. But that, again, is a lie. Dead things don't truly satisfy. Dead things are not the best things. And so remember this week when you're facing temptation that your flesh doesn't always want to escape the temptation. So be honest with yourself. Number two, fight temptation. It means trusting promises over your perceptions. That we trust the promises of God more than what we perceive, more than what we can see. You will know the truth and the truth will set you free as John 8 says. And so you and I are encouraged, and James is writing to encourage, to follow the promises of truth. Follow the promises of God's word, not the desire for something that isn't healthy. Joy comes with truth. We need that. Guilt and regret, it comes with what? Sin. And so you and I, we must choose truth. Choose promises more so than what you perceive and what you see. The third thing is this, is that when you give into temptation, confess it. When you fall and fail as you go into sin, you're invited to go straight to the cross. It's at the cross where our sin has been canceled. It's at the cross where we, uh, our sin has been paid in full. So confess. And 1 John 1, 9, a verse that many of us know and, and use in our own life is if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive, forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So if you're sitting here watching this, you're saying, wait, I, I've given in to temptation this past week. What do I do? We confess it. We go to the Lord and we confess our sin. We confess our unrighteousness. He is the one who forgives. He is the one who cleanses. So today, what do we do? We trust Jesus. We trust. We have this confidence in in, in Christ. And it's Christ who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet he is the one that did it without sin. He's the one who provides a, a way of escape. He is the one that is far more persistent and far more powerful and far more satisfying than what is common to us in the temptations that we face in this life. Truth is promising. Temptations leads to sin. I hope you'll take some time. I hope that you will gather your family around. I hope you'll spend some time in the family worship guide and actually talk out as you will be asked, what are some temptations that you face? And how do you resist those temptations? What do you do to fight them? And so go to God's word, open it up together as a family and be encouraged. May we pray. Our Father, we thank you for this day. And Lord, we hate the fact that we can't be together. But God, we know that you are doing a great work in the midst of this. And God, we are praying that as we face temptation, we would be reminded, first off, that you faced temptation. That Jesus did it without sin. And what encouragement for us that he was persistent and we can be persistent. That we can find power and strength and encouragement through you, through your promises and through your truth, that you are far more satisfying than sin. Sin leads to death. We know that dead things don't give us life. And so, Lord, I pray that you would help us this week as we face temptations, that we would endure, that we would persevere because we love you more than anything else. God, you know what is good and right for us. Help us to rest in that. May we see that you are more than enough. And God, may you be glorified through our lives. Lord, strengthen the people of gospel. May their hearts and minds flourish this week. May they be victorious 
this week as they are dependent upon you. God, we love you and we thank you. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Gospel, we are praying for you and we hope you have a great week. Take care.